Hello, my name is uh, Erik Hertog, and until recently I used to be a professor at what was formerly called Lesius in Antwerp in Belgium, which now, as of the 1st of October uh, of this year, 2013, is now part of the University of Leuven in Belgium. And I'm here at uh, La Laguna in Tenerife uh, to attend a meeting of a European Union project on victims, particularly victims of domestic violence. And we are trying to come up with all sorts of deliverables, as they're called, manuals, uh, guides, uh, did didactic instructive videos to assist interpreters in this particularly uh, difficult work. Um, but um, on the occasion of the meeting here in La Laguna, I was also invited by the Department of Interpreting and Translation Studies to give a lecture to the students. And the lecture I chose uh, is uh, on a topic that has been of some concern to me. Um, maybe also because recently in my hometown in Belgium, in Mechelen, uh, a very, very impressive, very beautiful, if I may use the word, but it's out of place and out of context, uh, Holocaust Museum was uh, opened. And on the fourth floor of that Holocaust Museum now, there is a temporary exhibition on Srebrenica and what happened there. And I've been talking to quite a number of people uh, who were involved in setting up that exhibition and particularly about the, their perceptions, uh, these were military that served in former Yugoslavia, and about the perceptions of the military um, about the people they used as interpreters, their locally employed uh, interpreters, and uh, the difficulties that these interpreters encountered working in the field. This is one of the stories, this is one of the case studies that I presented in my lecture last night, particularly the rather harrowing uh, incident that involved Hassan Duhanovic, who was an interpreter for the Dutch BAT battalion, the Dutch battalion of UNPROFOR of the United Nations uh, military forces in, um, in Bosnia at the time, we are talking mid-1990s. And um, this was a particularly um, uh, interesting incident in that it revealed the dilemma of many of these locally employed uh, interpreters caught in a sort, sort of catch-22 or catch-22, excuse me, situation between being or trying to be a professional interpreter on the one hand, but at the same time being involved as a witness um, in the story of their own people, their own identities, their own uh, religion. The um, other uh, case study which I presented was um, the case study of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa, um, where also the interpreters uh, were very often caught in this sphere of supposed professional neutrality between doing a good interpreting job on the one hand and then sometimes being, as it were, forced out of that space of interpreting where the interpreting and the personality of the interpreter became visible um, and when they broke out of their interpreting role and became a, a witness, as it were, involved in, in the situation. And I talked in this lecture about various um, recruitment problems of these interpreters, various motivation uh, issues that were at stake, and particularly also about the risks that many of these interpreters uh, ran. Um, the two case studies that I presented um, I chose because I had some marginal peripheral uh, involvement in these cases. Uh, we were invited, for example, at some point in the 1990s to come and train in South Africa the trainers, so we trained the trainers of the various languages that were going to be used in the TRC. 
And at some fairly late point, uh, I was also invited by the OSCE, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, uh, to come and train to in Kosovo some of the community interpreters that the OSC was training uh, for various um, uh, responsibilities in rebuilding uh, Kosovo after the war 1998-1999. Um, the final part of uh, the presentation that I gave uh, may be particularly relevant to the present day situation uh, because there's a great deal of concern, for example, about the risks that interpreters have run, are still running uh, in areas of conflict, whether they be military conflicts or whether they be humanitarian uh, missions. And of course, it's the events in Iraq where thousands of interpreters have been killed, uh, where many are now being left behind, uh, um, well, in Iraq, many were left behind, excuse me, as the US and other troops um, uh, left uh, the uh, military operation area. And it's continued that um, uh, har uh, harrowing story in, uh, in Afghanistan, uh, where again, as of the present day, when the uh, troops uh, are leaving the country, we are facing the same uh, uh, problems with the interpreters that threaten uh, to be left behind. And uh, this is a situation that um, is, is of concern in the sense that um, these interpreters go by many names. So people call them language assistants or translators or perhaps in a fairly derogatory way they call them fixers or even taxi drivers. But it's, it's, uh, it's amazing to see that when these incidents then fa hit the media, make the headlines, uh, that then these people, whether they be called fixers or taxi drivers, are then um, identified as interpreters. It's interpreters that are killed. And that is why in the final part of uh, the presentation, uh, I was pleased uh, actually to be able to point uh, to a number of initiatives that, that uh, have been taken uh, by the Council of Europe uh, calling for the protection of interpreters in conflict zones, but particularly also by, for example, uh, AIC, the International uh, Conference Association, uh, who has really made it a point and a very admirable point uh, to uh, come to the support of these locally employed uh, interpreters. And I think this, um, uh, this confidence building, this support really uh, from AIC uh, in, in, in this particular area and uh, for these particular people uh, is, uh, is, of, is of immense importance. It creates, as it were, I would say, an, an intra-professional solidarity uh, among the interpreters. Uh, I also mentioned, and again with great admiration really and respect for what they're doing, the virtual learning platform that University of Geneva uh, has set up and which perhaps could serve as a model um, for other uh, countries to link up to and enter into a dialogue with because I think um, that perhaps it's uh, the responsibility of the interpreting and training institutes um, to, to make that a concern because in many, many of our countries, uh, troops are employed on UN or international missions. Uh, we have humanitarian organizations that take uh, interpreters with them or recruit them on the spot. But there is very little, uh, as it were, pro active involvement as yet of the interpreting uh, institutes in trying to raise the awareness both of the employers of these interpreters and also empower the interpreters themselves uh, in the field. So I'm in a sense um, I think still very very much concerned about what's going on. Uh, we have we have international troops now in, in Congo, uh, in Mali, uh, and the same problems uh, are obviously going to be uh, seen there again. 
But on the other hand, I'm also in a sense uh, optimistic in, because a number of initiatives uh, uh, have been taken and I think uh, it, it is now on, beginning to be on the agenda uh, of uh, both the employers, the international organizations, as well as uh, certainly empowering uh, a considerable number of interpreters in the field. So that's what I've been doing here. Thank you.